And now, the best 60-ish seconds of your week. Well, we're halfway through summer, and this week, Joe Biden, well, he didn't really have such a good week. First, he told us that he had cancer, and then it was confirmed that he actually had COVID. Every American prays for the president and a speedy recovery. We're told to pray for our leaders, so we do that, and nobody wishes COVID on anybody. But you kind of can't escape the irony of the fact that the day he announced to the world that he had COVID was one year to the day after he told the American people and the people of the world that if you got these vaccines, you wouldn't get COVID. And he, of course, had every vaccine known to mankind and double boosted and all this other stuff. But the story goes on. Deborah Burks, you remember her, Dr. Fauci's sidekick during the early days of the pandemic. She now has a book out that's supposed to be a kiss and tell book, but sounds much more like a confessional as she essentially says, we made up a lot of this stuff as we went along and the things we were telling the American people were absolute truths. Well, maybe they weren't exactly that, something the rest of us already knew. And meanwhile, what does Joe Biden do? He doubles down on climate change. You know, this has gotten to be a very tired story, particularly if you go back and look at the history of the uh, histrionics and the scare tactics and the doomsday predictions that we've heard for so long and from so many. 50 years ago, it was that we were going to be in an ice age. Just a few years back, it was that New York City was going to be underwater by this time because of global warming. But what is it now? It's just this constant drumbeat from the Biden administration and their allies over fossil fuels and carbon footprints. Now, it's interesting to note that Joe Biden's home state, Delaware, doesn't have any offshore windmills, at least none that we know of, where 90% of their energy is produced by natural gas and that none of Joe Biden's various properties have solar panels on them. And the hypocrisy continues, most notably with his climate change czar or whatever the heck they call him, his special envoy, John Kerry, who's jet setting around the globe has thus far dumped more than 325 cubic tons of carbon into the atmosphere. He, of course, says, oh, it's so important for a guy like me to be able to travel on my private jets while the rest of you are in coach. And when you think about it, how much energy carbon footprint did Joe Biden produce flying over to Saudi Arabia to ask them to produce more oil for us and coming back empty handed? The truth is that the United States has already done more than anybody to reduce our carbon footprint. They've done it, we've done it, largely, we've done it, largely through natural gas. I mean, the fact of the matter here is that we don't have a climate crisis so much as we have an energy crisis. And as a result, the American people see it every day when they go to buy gasoline at the pump or contemplate home heating fuel this winter. Biden's approval ratings are in the tank at virtually an all-time low. And a Quinnipiac poll out last week showed that President Biden has less than 30% approval among white voters. That's not any great surprise, but here are two that I think are particularly troubling for the Biden administration and not all that surprising to the rest of us. Among African-American Americans, He's only got about 60% approval. But among Hispanic and Latinos, he has the lowest margin of any voting bloc, less than 20%. Think about that. Among Latinos and Hispanics, and a 70% disapproval rating. Now, that's not all because of climate change. It may be a little bit because Mrs. Biden wanted to call all of us tacos last week. But there were a lot of factors underneath that, including some of the cultural things. The Latino community doesn't, for example, support abortion on demand, something that the Biden administration wants to make a big deal these days. But the fact of the matter is he's in real political trouble. It's going to be seen in the midterms when he, whether he likes it or not, is on the ballot. And as crime continues to surge across the country, so unfortunately do crime stories. And there are just three that we want to chat about quickly this week. First, here in my home state of Pennsylvania, a Democrat. Supreme Court Justice excoriated Philadelphia District Attorney Larry Krasner in a separate 
concurring majority opinion, something which is very rare in and of itself, taking on Krasner line by line, item by item, over his failures in Philadelphia. At the same time, Republicans here are investigating the possible impeachment of Krasner for his nonfeasance in office. And in Indiana, a young hero takes out a killer allowing a lot of people's lives to be spared and halting a tragedy that could have been much, much worse. Interesting, the law that allowed him to openly carry his gun that day had only gone into effect a couple of days before, proving once again that the best defense against bad people with guns is good people with guns. And finally, in the state just north of me, New York, Lee Zeldin, the gubernatorial candidate, was attacked by a knife or sharp object wheeling assailant, and he took his arm out, grabbed him and forced him to the ground without being injured himself. But we're gonna see more of this. And what's interesting is that even some on the left now are acknowledging that funding the police is a much better idea than defunding them. And for now, that is the best 60-ish seconds of your week.